to think about the sort of projects that you might want to work on. And given that, and given your marine spatial plan, what are uh, some of the economic development opportunities of interest to the MRCs that you think recognize the aspirations of local communities and protect coastal resources? And if you could answer that in the chat box, please, that would be great. All right, <laughs> some of these out. Thank you, John. That's I love John's comment about ten percent and how the cells in our bodies. First kindergarten camps. Yeah, I was thinking about that uh, that field trip to the ghost forest, you know, as a parent, I uh, would be totally thrilled to have my kid come back muddy from a field trip, but um, was not surprised to hear that the superintendent was annoyed about the bus. It's okay, he got on board. <laughs> I just had to like sign my life away that and, and make the kids clean the bus. <laughs> Ah, uh, interesting comment, Kathleen. Yes, okay. All right, this is interesting. So, uh, that brings me to the next question. Can the opportunities that you're talking about uh, be developed in a way that maintain our current communities from now into the future and preserve our marine ecosystem for future generations. And it sounds like, uh, at least from some of the comments, that you um, rightly have some concerns about whether that's even, even possible. So, <clears throat> And I have to say, as a Washingtonian, let's see if this is working, you know, I often, I hear all of these ideas for all the different ways that we could be developing our offshore waters, and I, and I think, uh-huh, yeah, right, like, <laughs> I'm sure that we're going to be able to, um, you know, have uh, windmills out there right away and uh, we can have uh, net pens out in the deep ocean without any, uh, without any of them drifting away. But, uh, but we'll see. Um, some of these ideas, um, some of these ideas are being discussed for implementation in Southern California, so um, obviously much more hospitable waters, uh, but there might be interest um, in thinking about this stuff for the coast off of Washington. Which then brings us to, and I think somebody um, maybe uh, spoke about this earlier, what are some of the existing sustainable uses? And I think somebody had mentioned uh, fishing in particular. Do you want to protect and preserve to ensure uh, what the MSP calls economic vibrancy for coastal communities? Hmm. Okay, economically functional commercial fishing and shell fishing are very important. Excellent. Oops. So, uh, what do you think are some ways that we can use to uh, 
ensure that we maintain our maritime coastal communities from now into the future and ensure that our marine ecosystem is preserved for future generations. What have you guys talked about? Ah. Tourism. Well, that's interesting. Uh, let's see, tourism is big on this coast. Does tourism challenge, do, do efforts to develop tourism opportunities challenge your uh, area's ability to maintain sustainable commercial fisheries? Ah, okay. So in those questions, um, I quickly ran you through uh, the MSP's goals one, two, three, and five. And of course, you know, goal four, you probably already know about. Um, they're looking for a decision-making process to support proactive, adaptive, and efficient spatial planning. Well, uh, you guys, of course, are part of that and an important part of that. And so I had, you know, wanted in talking about ecosystem-based management and thinking about it to sort of initially I thought I'd end on a philosophical note because to me ecosystem-based management includes a lot of thinking over time and by that I mean I wanted to hark back to the beginning of my talk when I mentioned that I worked on ground fish fisheries um, when I started my career and uh, rockfish are a large subset of the uh, the larger groundfish category and if you know anything about rockfish you know that they are very long-lived and they are um, slow to mature they have to be sort of in their teens until they are reach reproductive maturity and so when you think over rockfish generations you're, you're thinking over something similar to human generations and uh, I really appreciated in um, the uh, revised code of Washington that they had this sort of lovely um, philosophical idea that puts the obligation on us to, um, to manage our ocean waters in a sustainable manner for current and future generations. And I hope that uh, as you're thinking about ecosystem-based management, I already know that you're thinking about future generations because your um, commitment to education and to ensuring that kids in your area have an opportunity to prepare for and think about natural resource careers is, uh, it's inspiring. I was so um, I very much moved by all of the work that went on in um, the MRC projects. But but as I was listening to all of you, I thought, well, um, let's, let's end on a practical note instead of a philosophical note. So I'm going to lay a couple things on you now. Um, practically speaking, you know, obviously you need money, right? And you've been talking a lot about how if only you had more money, um, you, could, uh, you could get more done. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. I don't know, and you should tell me if um, the MRC, if MRCs as entities or if individual MRC members are allowed to lobby the, West, the Washington State Legislature. You may not be allowed to do that under your, under your um, whatever your guiding um, laws are. So, so you can dismiss this if you like, but you're probably not prohibited from interacting with your federal legislators. And I wanted to throw up here, someone had mentioned on Thursday, I think it was, that uh, invasive species can be dealt with by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
And that is correct. And I went and looked up European green crab on the USDA's, um, you can see it, uh, a screenshot there, Invasive Species Information Center. And um, it's listed, it's an invasive species. Yes, they agree with that, but it is not one of their um, sort of top species that they're panicked about. And so I wanted to, you know, something that's been in the West Coast news lately is that California um, got a whole bunch of money, and apparently uh, Louisiana did as well, and other states, to, um, to work on nutria eradication. You guys probably know nutria are, um, they're, they're giant water rats. They're basically like beavers, um, and, but more focused on, their, or giant muskrats from South America. So that's a better way of describing them. But at any rate, non-natives and they're chewing up everything um, in our more southern areas of the country. And although I may have seen one a few years ago, but at any rate, um, so, you know, in the national news, when we think about people like Dianne Feinstein or John Kennedy, you know, what comes to mind is, you know, here are people who are deeply entrenched in their political parties and they are incumbents and, uh, you know, not able to work together on any major national policy issues. Well, uh, as you can see, they definitely are willing to work together on things that bother their constituents. And so, uh, you know, I would first, you know, urge you to think about how can you get in touch with the USDA to take European green crab more seriously, but also uh, whether you agree with them on general national policies or not, get in touch with your senators to um, maybe rewrite the Nutria legislation and uh, cut and paste, cut out Nutria and paste in European green crab. So something to think about. Um, how can we get six million dollars here in Washington to eliminate uh, or remove as much green crab as possible? I, um, in preparing for this talk, I watched, I think it was one of the MRCs on the North Coast did a short video on green crab and green, you know, looking for green crab and um, the, the footage from the northeastern part of the country with um, people pulling them out of the ba river banks by hand and they're just everywhere, you know, that, yeah, it's a little frightening in terms of thinking about uh, if we don't attack it now, they're going to be with us for quite a long time. So then, I know you know this, but uh, you know, also think about your Congress members. We are incredibly fortunate. You guys in particular are incredibly fortunate because both of the uh, congressional representatives for the outer Washington coast are on the appropriations committee. So don't be shy about ap approaching them uh, about funding so, because that's, that's what they're about. They are, um, now, the Appropriations Committee, you probably know, is the, uh, the House Committee that first sets up future budgets for the U.S. government. And um, what uh, Congress members like to do, even more than they like to fight with each other, is they like to bring money home for their districts. And it is perfectly fine and acceptable and um, you know, something you should definitely think about to get in touch with your Congress members uh, about uh, funding for some of your projects. And I encourage you to think about this in part because I often think that Washingtonians as a culture are more likely to say to themselves, oh, fine, we'll just take care of it ourselves. And um, <laughs> uh, I have colleagues in um, the Northeast part of the country who regularly get calls from fishermen and other constituents who are complaining about something and they are not getting what they want from, uh, from people like me. And uh, they threaten to call their Congress members, and they do. And then those Congress members come and, you know, wag their fingers at NOAA, and then things get done. So, um, you know, 
I, I guess I'm basically encouraging you to uh, to feel like as constituents, uh, your Congress members really do work for you. And uh, we are lucky on the Washington Coast to have people who are on and a very powerful uh, committee in the House of Representatives. So then from my world, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I work primarily in offshore fisheries. And um, Washington State has a number of different representatives to the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, the director of the Fish and Wildlife often usually does not show up to the um, Fishery Management Council meetings, but um, his uh, representatives do, and they're listed there in yellow. And, um, you know, I don't know if any of you know, I, one of my close colleagues, Corey Niles, and I, I hope I'm not outing him too much on this, but um, he has an amazing knowledge of the revised Code of Washington. And so uh, if you wanted some help around that, he could definitely, um, you know, lend his powerful brain to the process and thinking about how to um, to work on Washington State code. And then uh, the Pacific Fishery Management Council includes official government uh, designees, but it also includes um, members of the public. And uh, we are in Washington luckily lucky to be represented by Phil Anderson and. Butch Smith, and both of them are uh, very smart, um, although Butch has this funny way of always being very self-deprecating um, while saying something uh, incredibly clever at the same time. So uh, I would definitely recommend them as people to, to sort of help you think about how to move this process forward. And then I also wanted to mention, because you're so connected with habitat issues, the Habitat Committee. Um, and we have several members from Washington, uh, two from the National Marine Fisheries Service who are in Washington, and then uh, Randy Thurston at WDFW. And then uh, you met yesterday with uh, Tom Rudolph. He gave a presentation from Pew. And uh, if you ever have an issue that you think needs some nudging from the outside, then knowing Tom Rudolph and knowing other folks from environmental NGOs, uh, very, very helpful. So, and with that, if you ever have, you can also, uh, you're welcome to get in touch with me if there's some question about, um, you know, information that you need from NOAA or you need to know somebody in NOAA who does X, Y, or Z project. I don't, there's a lot that I don't work on, um, but there's a lot, I do know a lot of people who know a lot of people. And then the one thing I'm disappointed in is I need to go back and see if I can find, I had a page in here, I thought on, yes, here it is. All right, I'm gonna to try to get it up again, but I'm not gonna. So, um, grants, uh, this was my, this was back to my, I don't know why this didn't show up on screen, but uh, if you're looking for federal grants, uh, there is a website, grants.gov, and uh, you know, it has an amazing number of grant opportunities uh, for anything from habitat restoration to invasive species removal, or aquaculture. And I would say that in my agency, we often, um, you know, fo our folks from our headquarters have often spoken of Alaska as if it were a major aquaculture uh, state because of their very uh, large fish hatchery operations. And I once asked one of our, you know, super head high ups, um, do fish hatcheries count as aquaculture in your mind in the, for, um, for the granting of funds for things like infrastructure update? And he said, well, yes. And so uh, I would say, don't be shy when you're thinking about fish hatcheries. Uh, don't be shy about thinking about grants for, um, you know, as I said, improving infrastructure or acquiring broodstock. Uh, Think about aquaculture grants. And then the other, I would finally close with, um, even though I'm sort of going backwards and reclosing, 
the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation gives out a lot of habitat grants uh, focused on coastal resilience. So that's a place to look. And NOAA does as well. And I was looking at recent NOAA habitat restoration grants and uh, the ones done in the Pacific Northwest in recent years, none of them have included the outer coast of Washington. So I think you could argue that it's your turn. We've had a, several on the peninsula, but they're more in the Hood Canal area. Um, so at any rate, uh, something to think about. So I apologize for laying all that political and money stuff on you at the end there, but um, I felt like from the conversations over Thursday and Friday that, uh, that maybe that would be helpful. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Ivana. Um, there you go, Doug. You got something? I was just going to say there must be some questions here with the invasive species and fishing and stuff that that um, goes on. We have had, uh, I don't know how many members in this group are on the Washington Coastal Marine Advisory Council that did the marine spatial plan. Um, but one of the big concerns was, of course, uh, the industrialization of the sea, bringing in windmills and things that would disrupt the fishing community. Um, and we have been working on that very assiduously for a long time. And right now we're in the middle of whether or not we can get our shoreline master program um, engaged in enforceable policies. So, and we're doing a negotiation, I hope, with NOAA and Ecology to make that happen, um, giving us a little more legal clout going forward. Um, our real big contact on that is Dale Beasley, who's the head of the uh, Coalition of Coastal Fisheries. You've heard his name before, I'm sure. Uh, but I don't know if you have any advice on that, moving that forward. The, the SMP thing, I think, is, is a good policy for us moving forward. Um, and I think we'll get there, but it'll still take a little while. So I heard yesterday somebody had said something about Jay Inslee not, you know, moving these forward as, um, you know, into regulations or whatnot. And I want, that made me wonder, um, you know, I think on that, you probably need your state legislators help, the state legislators and state senators, and just say, look, uh, we want to, this to go into the revised code of Washington. What words can we use to make that happen? And because <laughs> because it, it has to come from the legislature first. And so I know the governor proposes a lot of legislation, but if, but if you push on your legislatures, sorry, that's me pushing, not pointing at you. Um, then then that will get things rolling with the governor. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Okay, so Marilyn says, uh, uh, we're told to apply. We never get funded. I think most of you, oh, that's too bad. Um, so I don't, unfortunately, I don't control any grants, um, but I do serve quite a lot as a grant reviewer. And um, I will say that when the, the grant reviewers have very narrow requirements and there is definitely a trick to writing grants. And um, I, I was wondering if, so I know you work a lot with the coastal tribes and then some of them are members of the MRCs and I wonder if um, any of them have any employ any grant writers or um, if the uh, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission employs grant writers and the reason I'm saying or maybe some of you are grant writers um, you know essentially when we're reviewing grants we have to follow the language of the grants very closely and um, this is a terrible thing to say but some people and some organizations are better than others at making their projects sound like they fit the grants precisely. And so um, that 
unfortunately can weed a lot of people out. Is that Christy? Yeah, may I, may I speak? Um, so I also had the privilege of reviewing some grants and I found a correlation between uh, their administrative um, budget that they actually put into their grant. Um, it also spoke to the fact that they had that administrative infrastructure. They are probably writing grants year round. They are, oh my goodness, the professionalism of the videos. And believe me, um, I'm here to try to hold on to anything that will give us, like Wickery, which I was involved with, um, access to those just preliminary collaboration dollars. Do you really think we can do pull together dozens of players like they have elsewhere in the state? Um, I attribute their ability to do that because they started with a, a basic infrastructure of having an administrative capacity to go after these grants. Well, I was, um, the, there's a woman who spoke yesterday from Pacific Coastal Salmon, I can't remember the, the full acronym, um, and it seemed like they might be good partners for you. Yeah. Yeah, that was beautiful. I, I would love to get together with her. She seems very close to Pacific County's uh, place of work. And I can imagine, so I, I know the folks in the, in NOAA's Habitat Restoration Center, and, um, and they would be a good connection for you, and I wonder if they would be a good connection for her group and for you guys, and together you could, you like know, that. yeah, so yeah, we should definitely get all of the different groups together. Um, Yvonne, I asked in the chat, um, or I mentioned in the chat that I've been reading this uh, ecosystem science capabilities required to support, support NOAA's mission in the year 2020. In fact, oh. I've been reading so many, every article I can get my hands on. I've been following you guys, and I'm really clear on your goals, and you're not meeting them. You want to disseminate the best science on the ground but you seem to put up your own obstacles within your charter to keep a hands-off approach meaning you're waiting for us to initiate and to ask and to provide the platform and it goes back once again if you have an infrastructure with which to invite you but we yeah. don't okay we have the gathering space uh-huh well uh well, that's an interesting comment. So, um, did you, did you, have you looked also, there was one of those um, uh, documents that I put up on the screen that was a 2015, I think it was Ecosystem Indicators for the Outer Coast. Oh, the one Washington? Yeah. I, I, I have not read that. But yeah. So, I mean, Part of this for me, so I work, I'm not a scientist myself, and I work with a lot of scientists, um, and I feel like a lot of times they like to get deep down in the weeds, and um, sometimes in their idea of creating processes, uh, they create these intricate processes that require a super giant amount of information, and, um, uh, and maybe sometimes I go too much in the other direction. I just sort of uh, feel like if you require this super giant amount of information before you can start ecosystem-based management, it becomes so intimidating that uh, nobody wants to do it. And, um, and what I was trying to say at the beginning of all this was, I really think, you know, given some of these amazing projects you guys have worked on, you already have, you know, you have the mindset and you're ready to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I am not an oyster expert or nearshore expert or whatever, but it sounds like you're going to be able to 
work through some of these challenges um, just by talking to each other. And I, I'm I'm amazed at um, you know some of these projects with with high school kids. It's definitely possible. So I guess my other uh, idea is don't be intimidated by all of the different you know into the weeds processes that are often suggested and if you do want NOAA scientists to talk to you about different bits and pieces then now is a great time to do that because you know where it might be difficult for somebody to travel um in normal times during the COVID times it's super easy to give a have a discussion over zoom So are there um, particular pieces of information that you're looking for that, or, you know? Um, I think it's, you know, we, we've tried to host workshops uh, for the community as we've moved through decades and decades of regulation. Um, they fall so flat. And oh, I did want to mention, you know, this carbon friendly forestry conference coming up. When I go to something like that, it's so entertaining. They've got Skittles during the break. They have 20 or half hour breaks and hour luncheons and breakfast is served and you get great information. And whenever we call our folks together, yeah, it's just sitting in the courthouse or, um, you know, we don't have the gathering infrastructure seriously we we our social infrastructure has broken down post spotted out we have not repaired those relationships and thus crossing paths has become difficult and thus we need the gathering spaces that naturally allow us to cross cross paths that's our theaters our libraries um that are all just falling apart because our economy has been, uh, you know, drained for 30 years. And it's all been held up with our volunteer money and our volunteer service to hold on. So we don't have much left to invest ourselves. Um, let me see here. That's a really good point, Christy. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that one of our county commissioners said, this region runs on volunteers and it's really people like the MRC people and others that have done just an enormous amount. I 